Now, this is a very simple example, like an inclined wall example. Uh, we want to see where the ball stops when we release the ball from the top of the inclined wall. So, in order to do that, we have two options. We either let it roll and see where it stops, that's obvious, and the other is represent this physics, like represents, represent these events of falling and rolling in terms of mathematics, like the equations, and predict where it stops. So, the first one is called experimental, experimental analysis, and in the experimental analysis, we actually see what we want to see. In the model, which is described in the second one, we actually predict what's going to happen or what's happening. We don't see it. So it's uh, counterintuitive to choose the second option, right? Because when we can see what's going on for the thing that we are interested, so why don't we do all the time experimental analysis? So why bother modeling? So that's the question. And now I will give some answers to that, why we choose modeling, because uh, some events are not always as simple as those inclined wall and ball example. Like here, uh, this heart, uh, when you want to uh, know what's going on when somebody got adrenaline rush, and if that guy has a, you know, like a heart attack or something, uh, so you need to model that. You need to model the impact of that adrenaline, and you need you need to see what's going on in the heart. I mean, there is no way that you can take take apart the heart from the body and uh, run an experiment on it, obviously. And sometimes, uh, experiment to to install experimental setups are pretty expensive. Like in a in case of a uh, jet engine, and you wanna uh, you wanna know uh, the performance of a jet engine under some conditions, you either need to build up a wind tunnel or you need to model it. But obviously, building a wind tunnel for a jet engine requires a lot of money. Instead, people are using models like CFD models to predict the performance of the jet engines. And um, sometimes you cannot see uh, what's going on inside a specific equipment, let's say, uh, by doing experiments. Like a fuel cell, for example. Uh, and we, cannot, we cannot see by experiment uh, the current distribution or the temperature distribution inside the fuel cell. Why? Because for the experiment you need to have like measuring points, physical measuring points attached to your equipment. But first, you cannot always uh, install those measuring points. For example, in a uh, membrane electrode assembly, like sandwich, you cannot put measuring points in the membrane of like 100 microns to measure the temperature distribution. That's impossible. And sometimes, experimental methods can be distractive. So when you uh, put measuring points, measuring elements, you can actually disrupt the actual physics. So the new physics of your experimental setup is actually warped. Like it's not the same as you want to do without the measuring points. And also, as you can see, <coughs> In this population pyramid, like you need so long time. Like this population pyramid provided by uh, economists, by the way, they uh, provide daily graphics, very cool graphics. Like this represents the world population by age groups, and it models, like it actually statistically collects the data from the past, from one from 1950. Uh, to 2010, which is available, but then they model the future till 2100. So there's no way that uh, you can do an experimental analysis on population demographics 
There are some examples like that also. And uh, here, uh, apart from these examples, like the, you can apply models to a lot of fields, a lot of like various fields, not only mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. Um, like you can do economic models, you can analyze uh, if a country uh, will be going to crisis in 10 years, 20 years or not, or you can uh, analyze a country's energy dependency in 50 years, or uh, you can have some biological models like a population, uh, what do they call it? I don't know, demographics in a bacteria environment like a habitat or quantum physics models and uh, quantum physics models like I want to uh, put an emphasis on that like the recent uh, very popular experiment Higgs boson experiment is actually modeled in 1950s or 1960s but why uh, they didn't do experiments because they lack the facilities to do that I mean they couldn't get to the energy levels required for Higgs boson experiments now like 50 years later they could reach that level to run experiments. Like my friend uh, who is working on quantum physics, now he is dealing with a whole bunch of uh, tensors, like equations, vectors, and I said, when are you going to do the experiments? Uh, he says, like, we need maybe 100 or 200 years. So it's not always a choice. It's like sometimes you have to model first uh, to build up the theory and then you need to uh, support your theory with experiments and computational fluid dynamics uh, is a specific type of modeling uh, which is interested in the fluid flow basically but not only that also mass transfer uh, species transfer, heat transfer which are coming with the fluid flow, associated with the fluid flow, and uh, model these phenomena, the phenomena that Professor Adam Mahmoud uh, described in the previous lectures, model these phenomena, I put these phenomena into equations, like partial differential equations, and solve them by the help of computers. Well, uh, it's early to talk about numerical techniques, but uh, there are some equations that you can solve analytically like a ordinary differential equation in a second degree like mx dot dot plus kx uh, bx dot plus kx you can solve it analytically there are analytical solutions in closed form but some equations up to now I mean, uh, up to Wednesday uh, 17th of uh, <laughs> July there are no solutions like now you Stokes equations and uh, many partial differential equations that govern the physical phenomena in a fuel cell or in a uh, flow related problems so you need to employ some numerical techniques uh, to solve these models so why do we need CFD? because uh, as we said uh, we want to understand what's going on first and sometimes uh, we use CFT for product development. Uh, I will give some examples in, in the uh, future slides. And sometimes troubleshooting. This is very important because something happens to your equipment and you don't know why. Like you cannot, uh, you, you haven't seen it before, but you have some clue. You have some clue that it may be because of, I don't know, some uh, change in the parameter, like the, you uh, play with temperature and it increased. The temperature increased and that uh, thing happened. So you go to your model and you change your temperature in your model and you see what can cause that problem. So for troubleshooting uh, it's very important to use CFT. But uh, as we said before, CFT analysis needs to be uh, supported with experiments and testing. Because like in CFT you have uh, equations those are universal equations. Okay, uh, those can apply. For example, Navier-Stokes equations can apply to either jet engines or a flow field in a fuel cell. I agree. 
But there are some parameters in those equations that you have to measure, like the uh, thermal conductivity of your material. It's not universal. And it depends on uh, the manufacturing techniques, uh, the material that, that, that you use, for example, in the GDL. And it is very specific to your product. And you have to measure it. And there's not a universal parameter database. <coughs> OK, like um, applications of CFT can be numerous. Uh, it is basically related to the flow. Wherever there's a flow, you can apply CFT. But the flow needs to be continuous. Uh, I'll talk about it later. Um, let's start with the example. So, uh, this is a real case. Uh, the right figure. This is the Empire State Building. And the people who live in the uh, upper floors of the Empire State Building realized that, like experienced, that some days, in rainy days, the raindrops actually go upwards. <laughs> so this uh, like a fascinating uh, phenomenon, actually. But that is, that is explained by these guys' study here. Uh, they model the flow fields around the Empire State Building, and they realize that sometimes there are some upward winds that cause the convection of the raindrops upwards. So that's like an explanation of a magical thing, right? And that was uh, two university students from University of Aachen who did their uh, summer internship or, I don't know, like work and travel type of thing in New York. Uh, like a similar example can be seen in that Dubai building. Uh, I think it's Burj Al Arab or? Burj Al Arab. Burj Al Arab, right? Burj Khalifa. Burj Khalifa. Burj Arab, sorry. <laughs> okay, I don't know. But I'm always confused with this two. Who, what, which one was the, lo the, the tallest one? This is Burj Al Arab. Burj Al Arab is the tallest one, right? It's the mountain of the Arab. Okay, all right. Uh, we can confirm it with the Arabic speaking students of our class. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, th this is a similar modeling study that is performed on Burj Al Arab building. And those. This, this picture sh is showing uh, the flow fields around, around the building. Another <coughs> very interesting application of CFT is used by uh, bicycle manufacturers, like this company, Canadian uh, race bikes company, Cervelo. Uh, they use a specific CFT software uh, to develop their uh, racing bike and they said it the, the new design is actually decreased uh, the aerodynamic drag so it's, it's for their benefits and for the benefits of the races not sorry races is not a good term the competitors another thing is uh, the helmet manufacturers use CFT uh, in this case uh, they on the left hand uh, they use a wind tunnel model, uh, a dummy model, uh, to simulate the wind over the helmet. And uh, here they provide two simulations, CFT simulations, uh, which they did for the helmet design that they uh, pr proposed. Um, Formula One race cars, pretty much employ CFT in their uh, product developments. One reason is that they need to uh, use wind tunnels to simulate aerodynamic drag uh, over the Formula 1 race car, which is one of the most important parameters in a Formula 1 race, Formula one race car. But building a wind tunnel and testing in a wind tunnel requires a lot of effort and money. So in 2005, BMW's software team uh, invested on uh, CFT models for their improvements of their Formula One car. And you can see uh, the original images from that study. 
Okay, you can say that these are not rocket science, so I'm <laughs> going to provide a picture which is a rocket science. Uh, there is a, uh, what was it, NASA X-34 hypersonic uh, rocket re-entering uh, the atmosphere. And what you see here, what you see here is this, I cannot use this. Here are the shock waves, like shock waves, and this simulation is uh, for open shock capture. Like shock waves uh, are, uh, you know, when you go over the speed of sound, then uh, there is a pressure difference between uh, between some certain boundary that you pass and that certain boundary is called the shock wave. Uh, there are some other cool examples. Like this one uh, is made by a zoo, I think in California or somewhere else in the US. And uh, there's an elephant cage. And that image shows the temperature distribution and heat wave propagation uh, due to the ventilation of the cage. And you see. Uh, as you can guess, uh, next to the ears of the elephant, it is colder, cooler, and the areas where the ventilation is low, you see hotter, like uh, red, red color. Also, another uh, cool study here, and these are not fantasy studies, though. These are all related to product development. These are real studies, and. Uh, the companies invest a lot of money in that. Like this company is Wilson, you know, the football uh, manufacturer uh, or a sporting goods manufacturer. Uh, they use the CFD software uh, to analyze the aerodynamic effects over the football, like the soccer ball. And in this study, like they could model with the help of the specific software, they could model the ball not as like a uh, perfect sphere, because the ball is not a perfect sphere. It had stitches, it had panels, which had uh, tremendous effects in terms of the aerodynamic thing. I don't know uh, if everyone is interested in football, but when you... Okay. <coughs> I guess that. <coughs> you remember the goal of Roberto Carlos, like 10 years ago, uh, to France. So, sorry, French guys, but... <laughs> <laughs> so you remember uh, the ball, like when it was going out, it just turned and it did in. So that was due to the aerodynamic effects around the balls. And that is uh, most probably caused by the unperfectness of the ball due to the stitches on the panels. Are you saying that that is not very important? Well, the guy himself confessed that <laughs> it was not uh, something intended. You know? <laughs> he also said that it was like a miracle thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we talk about the CFT and how good the CFT is, but it's not always like that. I mean, uh, I'm objective here. <laughs> I need to talk about the limitations and restrictions of the CFT as well. Uh, well, CFT solutions is is written here, can only be as accurate as the physical model that is developed. Which means that like, you cannot always 100% put the physical phenomena into equations. Like, your equations are also like assumptions. For example, uh, when you are modeling a gas, like pressure and temperature relation in a gas. We always use ideal gas law, right? But it's not the real case. For example, in hydrogen, uh, at 200 bars, ideal gas law doesn't hold. But we still use ideal gas law. Also, uh, another limitation is numerical errors. As I said, we need to solve these equations uh, in computers, like we discretize the equations and uh, we have the software to solve it. But the software employs some numerical techniques 
at the end there are some residues and some truncation errors so uh, it is not exactly the same like it, it, it can suit your needs if you want to have two percent one percent uh, safety margin you can reach that but if you want to have very very specific goals I mean if you are uh, working in the military industry defense industry or if you, if you are working in a aerospace industry you need to be more precise and sometimes you can have some troubles with numerical techniques also the boundary conditions I think that's the uh, biggest problem because it's very hard to uh, specify the boundary conditions for example uh, think about this room and if you want to uh, model the heat transfer, the temperature distribution in this room, and we need to give the boundaries uh, some properties. Like this boundary, for example, we can say this wall, we need to assume that this wall is isothermal, which is all along the wall, the temperature is the same. Is it true? No. It's not the same. But what else can you do? You need to give flux, like heat flux, which is there is a heat flow outside or inside to this wall. But how accurate, how precise can you be by uh, defining the heat flow from outside to inside? So boundary conditions are always a problem. And I think it is the weakest, weakest link of the uh, whole story. Now after we uh, introduce CFD modeling in a broader perspective, we are going to go somehow into details about fuel cell CFD modeling. Well, uh, we can employ CFD modeling in fuel cells because we have flow, we have mass transfer. So it's okay to use CFD modeling. Uh, why do we use modeling, fuel cell modeling? Like it is the same thing, like to assist the product development. Sometimes in fuel cells, there are some phenomena that still not understood, like how the impurities affect the fuel cell performance. Like you introduce carbon monoxide in your fuel stream, and your performance is decreased. But still, it's not 100%. Uh, we are not 100% sure about the exact mechanism how the impurities affect the fuel cell performance or in a salty environment uh, when you run your fuel cell for example on the sea the sea salt is actually contaminating your airstream and it will impact uh, the fuel cell performance but how is still not well understood uh, yeah and uh, for the obvious reasons to predict the fuel cell behavior under different conditions, what, ha what happens when you increase the temperature, what happens when you uh, put your fuel cell in a less humid, more humid environment and stuff like that. And, uh, one other important thing is to guess the durability and lifetime of the cell. Well, uh, now in fuel cell technology, uh, we are facing two, uh, the, the, the two biggest problems that we are facing are the economics of the fuel cells, because they are still expensive, and the durability. So the durability issue, to, uh, to extend the lifetime of the fuel cell, you really need to understand what are the reasons that these guys are degrading, what are the degradation mechanisms that are leading the fuel cells to go, uh, to not, not, not go beyond their uh, prescribed lifetimes. Okay, so in order to model, reliability. sorry, reliability. well, reliability is broader. Like durability is like this microphone. If you hit it <laughs> on the stone, if it is broken, it's not durable. But reliability is something like, do you rely on the system? Like when you put your fuel cell system uh, on top of the hill and you leave it like that, if it is working, 
then it's reliable. Reliability is related to the peace of mind that the product will give you. But durability is more mechanistic term. Reliability takes care of those extreme conditions. Yes, but generally we model the durability because <laughs> reliability has uh, some other aspect as well. Like you need to also include the socio-economic aspects as well. Now, uh, in any type of modeling, we need to first define the geometry that we want to work on. For example, in this stack, uh, let's say we are going to model a single cell. Single cell means like one membrane electrode assembly sandwiched by the gas channels. So we are looking at the stack from this direction and we are interested in these uh, three guys over there and in a, a better description we have our gas channels sandwiched by the bipolar plates which are also called the current collectors and we have our NEA well, now the question is how detailed you want your model to be like the NEA can be modeled as a single domain or it can be modeled by making subdomains like NEA is consisted of the gas diffusion layers right? the catalyst layers and the membrane but the most common uh, NEA description includes five layers at least sometimes they also include the gas channels into the MEA but I Let's, let's define it like that. This is our MEA, and we divide our MEA into anode and cathode gas diffusion layers, catalyst layers, and the membrane. All right? Uh, one thing, <coughs> if you are into modeling, and if you look at the papers, modeling papers, most of the times, they don't include the catalyst layers. They just take it as like, anode electrode, cathode electrode, and the catalyst layers as the boundary. Well, it is acceptable up to a, some extent. Why do they do that? Because the anode GDL, the gas diffusion layer, is uh, about like 200 micrometers. Whereas the catalyst layer, the catalyst layer is where the reaction actually takes place. The reaction takes place in the order of magnitude of 10 micrometers. So the gas diffusion layer is 20 times more than the catalyst layer. So there is a big aspect ratio. And in order to do uh, the modeling, you need to discretize each domain. And if you start discretizing the catalyst layers, so you have very tiny elements. And you need to be proportionate in all of your domains. But when you have tiny elements in your catalyst layers, you need to have tiny elements in your GDLs as well to have a similar aspect ratio. So that will put, that will require significant computational effort. So that's why some people pre uh, prefer modeling the catalyst layers as just the boundaries. Okay. But after uh, defining your domains, uh, please keep this figure on the right bottom in mind because we will use it uh, in the proceeding slides. So we will start with defining equations in the domains. Like what? First, we need to be sure <coughs> what are the physical phenomena, the governing physical phenomena in a fuel cell, and where, in which domains, each specific physical equation will apply, will be applied. Uh, let's start with mass transfer. The mass transfer <coughs> is basically the transfer of fuel and the oxidant, like hydrogen and oxygen, to the fuel cell, and it's 
transport inside the fuel cell. So we have mass transport in the fuel channels, fuel and air channels, in the GDLs, in the catalysts, and in the membranes. It's obvious because we have something moving inside all these specified fields. Uh, momentum transfer is what we call the fluid flow. Okay? And where do we have fluid flow? Obviously in the fuel and, fuel and air channels, in the GDS, <coughs> and in the cattle states. Under normal operation, and most of the cases, we don't have fluid flow in the membrane. At least we can assume that. So membrane <coughs> uh, is not permeable. That's our assumption. Okay? So there's no fluid flow from anode side to cathode side, which is there is no hydrogen going from anode side to cathode side, which means there is no leak from anode side to cathode side. But there's a big assumption because in reality we have crossover. We have leaks. Right? But again, like it is very hard to model the leaks. So we just need like that. We assume that uh, there is no leaks and there is no momentum transfer in the membrane. So I'm imposing a very big assumption here. So as we said in the beginning, <coughs> our model is as accurate as how we put the, put, put the equations. And I know that I'm putting the equation as not 100% correct. <laughs> so uh, I'm decreasing my confidence limits here. But is it acceptable or not? You need to answer that, okay? The species transfer uh, it's actually wherever you have the mass transfer, you also have the species transfer. Uh, we differentiate it as, like Adam Mahmoud uh, explained, we differentiate it because when we have uh, different species in a flow field, like in the f in the fuel channel, we have hydrogen, we have uh, water. In the air channel, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen. <coughs> so we have <coughs> transfer, relative transfer between these species as well. <coughs> we have heat transfer everywhere. Um, and we have charge transfers. We have two types of charge transfer. One is the negative charge transfer, which is electronic transfer, electron transfer. Uh, the electrons are actually moving from anode side to cathode side while uh, completing the circuit. And the other is the positive charge transfer, which are the protons. Okay? The protons are transferred from anode to cathode. Right? So we have ionic charge transfer in the cathode series and the membrane, whereas we have electronic charge transfer in the cathode series, GDLs, and uh, the bipolar plates. Okay. <coughs> so up to now, uh, does anyone have any questions? Am I going too fast or <laughs> everyone is catching up? Okay. Because now uh, we'll have more fun. <laughs> no question means everybody understood. Excuse me? No question means everybody understood. Or nobody understood nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's have a five second pause <laughs> because we will enter a different field, like the equation field, equations. Uh, like some people live with equations and some people hate them, but that's the reality. Uh, I think I'm uh, the first, first time. So, uh, we can actually model every kind of physical phenomena in a fuel cell that we can represent it in equations. So let's start with the uh, mass balance or the continuity equation. Okay? Uh, but all these, all these like mass transfer, momentum transfer, species transfer, like all these phenomena. Uh, is related to the conservation laws, which is, if we talk about the mass, you cannot uh, generate the mass or terminate the mass. That's it. Like you, whatever you let into the system and whatever you let out of the system, and that's 
how much you accumulate in the system. The, that equation, uh, sigma q in minus sigma q out, is what I said, like verbally, right? Uh, to put in more realistic ways, like you have a crate, and you are putting apples into that crate. At the same time, somebody else is taking out some apples. So if you put four apples, and at the same time, the other guy takes two apples, like you put net of two apples at that specific moment, right? So after, after a certain time, you have accumulation in the crate. On the other hand, when somebody else is taking more apples than you, what you put, you have depletion in the crate. It's also related to your bank account. Like your <laughs> if your salary is more than what you spent, you actually uh, <laughs> save. But if you're married, <laughs> <laughs> if your wife spends more than what you what you earn, then you're in a uh, financial crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I really wanted to uh, have a comment on Greek economy on this perspective, but we have Georgios here <laughs> who would hate me if I do that. <laughs> so uh, I stop. <laughs> Well, uh, like all these words can be described by this equation, right? So the total of the substances that we put into control volume, which was the crate or the bank account, right? Control volume is closed, right? Because in your bank account as well, you don't have other leaks. You're, <laughs> you're not supposed to have other leaks, right? So, uh, whatever you put in, the total of you put in, minus the total of you uh, give out of the control volume, is the rate of change of that substance in that control volume. And uh, the rate of change being positive means you have accumulation, which is this derivative. This derivative being negative means you have depletion. Okay. Uh, we are going more elucidated. What we did here is only time dependent. <coughs> but we deal with somebody putting apples and somebody putting out of apples, taking out of apples. <laughs> uh, we are looking at change with respect to time only. But we didn't look at like what we didn't look at this, the distribution of the apples inside the crate. Maybe there are more apples here, there are less apples here, right? Because uh, when you start putting more apples from this this part, you have an accumulation more here, and you have less apples stacked up at the right side. But with this equation, we are not looking at that. Now, we are going to formulate another equation based on this one to also look at the spatial variation. Like the variation, the distribution of uh, the quantity inside your control volume. Right? <coughs> uh, so I want to go uh, into details of this equation a little bit. <coughs> And we are going to derive our continuity equation with that. So if we choose the infinitesimal uh, control volume, and we will look at the mass in and mass out, like if you look at the mass balance, all right? Like the ma now, I want to introduce a term called flux. Flux is uh, a special term that we use frequently in modeling and in transport phenomena, flux is the rate of change in a substance over a cross-sectional area, which is when you have a cross-sectional area, okay, like that, 
the flux is the rate of change over that cross-sectional area. For example, um, Q dot is our mass flux, let's say, all right? And the mass flux, if we say the mass flux, mass is, you know, kilogram, right? Over second over meter square. My mass flux is defined as mass over the rate of change of the mass, all right, in time, over a specific certain uh, specific surface area. Uh, surface area. Okay? So we always have the unit as whatever substance we are talking about, kilogram, over second and meter square. So uh, the mass flux can be defined as rho times V times ACS. Okay? Actually, rho times V. Sorry, forget about the ACS. It's a mistake there. Rho is your density and V is your velocity. This is widely used in transport phenomena. Let's look at the units, okay? Rho, the, de the unit of the density is kilograms per meter cube, right? And velocity as unit of meters per second. And we have kilograms per uh, square, square meters per second. So this is our mass flux, okay? And when we're driving the equation, uh, we use the fluxes. So, the mass in over that surface is actually Q dot X, the mass flux at X coordinate, and the mass out is mass flux at X plus delta X coordinate. Okay? But, when we were looking at this equation, you're actually talking about the total substance, okay? Not the mat, uh, not not the flux. So uh, we need to multiply it with the surface area to find the total substance, uh, the rate of total substance, rate of mass carried into control volume through this control surface. So we multiply it with this surface area, which is delta y times delta z. Delta y, delta x, delta z, these are infinitely small scales, right? And likewise, here at mass out, we define the mass out like this, by multiplying it with the surface area. Okay. And if you look at this equation, we have on the left hand side the rate of change of mass in the control volume and the rate of change uh, the rate of mass sorry <laughs> rate of change of mass is defined like that okay you can verify it by looking at the units this is meter cube kilograms per meter cube per second times meter cube you have what? kilograms per second right? So when we put these three uh, terms into this equation, we have, forget about this, okay? We have this term, this term, and this term. Like I, one term with the other dimensions, like y and z dimensions, and I end up with this three-dimensional equation. Now. Uh, if I have this delta x, delta y, delta z term here, take it over to the right hand side, which is like dividing each term with this delta x, delta y, delta z, what I have is, just concentrate on this term first, rho u x minus rho u x plus delta x over delta x, okay? And that is Nothing but the definition of the partial derivative. 
which is del rho u over del x. Okay? Is this term. Likewise, for the other term, I have the partial derivative of rho v, and I have a partial derivative in terms of z coordinate. So I'm not expecting you uh, to grasp everything from this slide. You need to go go over by yourself. Now at the end, I can combine this uh, into this simple equation, which can also be represented as this one, which is called the divergence. Okay, and that's my continuity equation. Del root del t is divergence rho v. This side is related to the time of x, the change in the time, and this side is related to the change in the space coordinates, like the distribution into the comp uh, in, in the control volume. Uh, any questions so far? Come on, you must have some questions here. <laughs> okay. So this this is my basic equation, and uh, this most frequently used equation. Right? Uh, now I'm going to talk about the concept of the steady state and transient. When we, when I have this equation, that word that t, if I go to infinity in time, which is there is enough time, uh, then this term, d rho dt, goes to zero. <coughs> when this term goes to zero, I call it steady state. Okay, <coughs> so when I have this term vanish, I have steady state. I'm here, okay? When this term is not zero, I'm at this region. It's what called the transient response, transient regime. Uh, that's important because sometimes uh, we differentiate in modeling. Sometimes we do the transient models, sometimes we do the steady state models. Steady state models uh, is important while we're just focused on uh, the spatial distribution. For example, the temperature uh, distribution in a fuel cell. When we are interested in temperature evolution in the fuel cell, we look at the transient simulation. Okay. Likewise, I can have the flux term. The flux term goes to zero. Okay. Like the rho v. What was rho v? As we define, mass flux, right? So, what does it mean? Mass flux is equal to zero. If I'm talking about flux. I need to be at a boundary, at a control surface, right? So what does it mean? Mass flux at this control surface is zero. There is no change of mass. It's actually insulation. Let's not talk about mass and let's generalize it. When I have no flux, okay, no flux at a boundary, that means insulation. That flux can be mass. That flux can be uh, heat. That flux can be, I don't know, momentum. Right? So, in case of heat, there is insulation. Like this is insulated wall, means there are bricks, like insulation bricks over there, and there is no heat going out of the system. Okay. Okay. So, applying mass transfer into my fuel sound model. As we said, the mass transfer is almost everywhere. 
uh, wherever there is flow or there is uh, movement of mass, obviously there is no in the current collectors, bipolar plates, okay? So I have fuel in and the hydrogen is going to the GDL, okay? And at this cathode sphere, it reacts and uh, it turns into proton. You can also think of proton as mass, but we, uh, we put a special meaning to that proton transfer. We call it charge transfer, okay? But we also have water formation due to the reaction on the other side. And the water is also transferred from cathode to anode, or vice versa, which we will uh, go, go through in the next slides. Uh, yeah. So, this is my equation in the steady state. For the sake of, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I want to uh, focus on the steady state for the time being. And steady state continuity equation says there is no mass generation or there is no mass depletion, which is logical, right? Because, as we all know, you cannot terminate a mass. You cannot uh, generate a mass. But in case of fuel cells, <laughs> that may be a bit different because we have chemical reactions and we actually not terminate the mass but transform the mass that we are talking about in these channels okay? <coughs> and we transform it into other substances we are not terminating it but we are transforming it to other substances so this equation needs to be modified <coughs> at the catalyst layers where we have reactions Okay, but at the end, sorry, at the end, this mass balance will hold. <coughs> Although like, you have hydrogen coming in from the fuel inlet, and hydrogen, some hydrogen, uh, reacted and transformed, and the remaining hydrogen will go out. <coughs> we don't apply uh, this mass balance only here. We apply this mass balance for the entire picture, okay? So what we need to say is the total hydrogen, the total uh, oxi oxidants, like oxygen and nitrogen entering to the system is equal to the total hydrogen going out, total oxygen, total nitrogen going out, and total water going out. If we didn't have any water, like this hydrogen and oxygen transport into water. So we need to put that into our mass balance. Okay? I'm uh, putting the emphasis on that because that's a very typical mistake of those who start modeling uh, recently. <coughs> like you don't apply mass balance in the subdomains. You apply the mass balance in your entire domain. Okay. All right. A species transfer uh, is also mass transfer, but why uh, we differentiate the we, we differentiate this from the mass transfer is uh, when we have two different substances or more than two different substances. Uh, the transport behavior changes because like we have hydrogen and water in the fuel channel. Okay, the, we in the mass balance we talked about uh, the transport of the bulk from one point to the other point. But now we are going to study the transport of each species the movement of each species with respect to the other, or with respect to the bulk, okay? So, uh, in case of cathode side, uh, in the cathode flow field, we have three species. What are those? Uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and water, okay? 
So there are interactions between between uh, each pairs, each species pairs. Like there are interactions between oxygen and water. There are interactions between oxygen and nitrogen, and there are interactions between <laughs> water and nitrogen. Okay, so these interactions, like individual interactions, actually defines individual species movements from one point to the other. So, based on these interactions, uh, oxygen may move from this point to this point faster than nitrogen. Okay, <laughs> so that's why species species transfer uh, is important. By the way, you can also model it in a different way. Like here, uh, we, did, we, we, we took individual interactions between species pairs. Right? This is a more complex one, but more appropriate one. But we can also simplify it. You can take <laughs> the entire, uh, entire cathode <laughs> flow field is like the cathode mixture, and you can look at the interactions between each species, between each species and the cathode bulk mixture. So instead of looking at oxygen, the interaction between oxygen and water, and oxygen uh, with nitrogen separately, we just do it in one at once by looking at the interactions between oxygen and the bulk cathode mixture. So we get rid of one dependency here, which makes life simpler, but less accurate. OK. Um, so species equation uh, can be derived in the same way as we derive the continuity equation, the mass balance. OK. Uh, as you remember, in the continuity equation, we have our transient term is equal to our spatial term, okay? And rho v was our flux, mass flux. What we need to do is nothing but changing uh, these properties. Like instead of rho v, we need to use species flux. And instead of rho, which is the mass, the rate of mass, we need to use the rate of species here. Uh, we're still talking about uh, the steady state equation. So the flux, the flux uh, in species equation has two terms. Okay. Yes, has two terms. One is the diffusion term, and the other is the convection term. So can anyone tell me the difference between diffusion and convection terms? based on what you learned in Adam Mamluk's class. Yeah. Any idea? <laughs> Try in English, I, I can help you. <laughs> okay, we are talking about uh, the transfer of one species from one side to the other side. So that can happen in two separate ways. One way, forget about the bottom, okay? One is uh, the species will be transferred from the higher concentration parts to the lower concentration parts, okay? So, like that, that, that is intuitive, right? Like when you have, uh, I don't know, what's, what's concentration? Concentration, concentration gradient. Yeah, this this due to concentration gradient. Like if you have um, more balls here, okay, and if you have less balls here, the potential will drive the balls to reach to the other side, so that you will have a complete equal number of balls at both sides. That's one mechanism that drives the species transfer. But there is another one. Like when you have flow, okay, even if you don't have the difference in concentration, if C1 is equal to C2, okay, 
even when you have an equal concentration, you have a transfer because you are moving with the flow, with the bulk of the flow. Okay, so that's what we call the convection. The convection is the same as like heat. When uh, like when you have uh, what do you call when you have a flow, okay, and when you have uh, the inlets, like higher temperatures, the, the temperature, the heat will tra heat will be transferred by the flow. Or when you stir, is a uh, simple example. When you stir uh, a cup of tea, you know it will it will be that will be heat transferred because of your movement. Right. So we have two distinct transfer mechanism. One is the diffusion and what is the convection and the diffusion flux is defined as here okay and uh, this d is what we call the diffusivity and del c del x is the concentration gradient okay and uh, when we put it in the vector form we define it like this right and the co convection uh, flux, convective flux, is defined as uh, the velocity of the flow field times the concentration at at the at, at the particular uh, particular coordinate. Okay. Defining defining my species flux like that, I can I can go back to my or I can go back to my equation like continuity equation, right? Or conservation, general conservation equation. I can put J uh, in there. So at steady state, I have, I come up with this, and if I continue with uh, the driving, the duration, I end up with this equation at steady state. And if I put also the transit term, I have this equation. Again, like I'm not expecting you to grasp everything uh, explained here at that moment, but uh, just to give you an idea so that you can develop your own understanding when you're going through this material. All right. <coughs> um, when we were talking about the continuity or mass transfer, like this guy is zero, is not true at the catalyst layer we said, right? So this has to be modified. And at the catalyst here, we introduce source terms to modify that equation. So for the source term, like if you talk uh, if you talk about hydrogen, okay, so this equation uh, we have a source term for hydrogen at the end of catalyst layer because there is a hydrogen depletion there. If we are talking about oxygen, if this C is a concentration of oxygen, so we need to introduce a source term for oxygen at the cathode catalyst state. Uh, from this discussion, you can also understand that we need to introduce equations for each species, for hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay. So we will have uh, three equations. Um, let's go to the source terms. The source term uh, is actually the uh, generation of the species or depletion of the species at specific domains. So at the anode catalyst layer, where we have anode reaction, anode half reaction, uh, we have hydrogen generation, right? And on the other side, at cathode catalyst here, we have oxygen depletion. So did I say hydrogen generation? So, sorry, that was hydrogen depletion. And at the cathode catalyst here, due to cathode chemical reaction, we have depletion in oxygen and generation in water. So what are, like how much water is generated? We can actually uh, correlate the mass generated mass or uh, species generated with the current. 
And if you look at the definition of current, current is actually number of electrons for sorry, number of charge uh, at per unit time, okay? So when you define it like this, the current is nothing but number of moles times the Faraday constant, okay? So when you uh, divide the, Faraday, the current with the Faraday constant, if you uh, go on with units, you can, um, you can understand easily, and you will have moles of electrons as I over F. So in our fuel cell reaction, for one electron, sorry, for one hydrogen molecule, we have two electrons generated. So if this, this is the most of electrons generated, is I over F, so the hydrogen depletion should be nothing but I over to F. Likewise, for one oxygen molecule, we generate four electrons, or we deplete four electrons. So, most of oxygen content will be IO4F. And most of water generated will be IO2F. Okay? So now, uh, after mentioning about the water generated at the, ca uh, at the cathode, we need to talk about something on the water transfer. So there are different mechanisms that water transfer is governed across the membrane. So one mechanism is uh, the permeation. Okay. Well, in the beginning of the lecture, we said let's assume no permeation, but I just want to mention that for the sake of completeness. When we have a pressure gradient, let's say we have cathode at two bars and we have anode at one bar. So there will be a pressure driven flow, right? So the, the pressure will force the flow uh, go through the membrane and come at the anode side. Like the membrane is not like a brick wall. It's like a polymer. So it has some permeability at the end. And if you apply high pressure difference across across two sides of the membrane, there will be a flow induced. And if you work at similar pressures, you will have negligible flow. Uh, so one way the water transfer is due to uh, the pressure driven flow, which we call permeation. And the other mechanism is the same as the concentration gradient. When we have more water at the cathode side, okay, than at the anode side, so we have a flow from cathode side to the anode side due to the concentration difference. So that uh, the concentration will be forced to go to equal, to go to equilibrium. And another one, very distinct phenomena, is called the electrolytic drag, okay, and that is very specific to fuel cells, or let's say the polymeric material used in fuel cells, uh, the water molecules in the membrane are attached to the protons, okay? And the water molecule plus proton will make up like H2O plus H plus, what you have, H3O plus. You have a charged molecule, okay? In the form of water. The water is charged. And we know that we have a potential, like the electrical potential difference between anode and cathode. And under the potential difference, the charged particles move. And we, the, the transfer, the movement will be from anode to cathode. Okay? Like the proton transfer. So these are uh, three distinct water transfer mechanisms. Uh, this is the same 
maybe I should have thought on this picture, but this, this is the same uh, description. But that, that's good in, uh, in uh, realizing the dimensions of these domains. Like this is my GDL, uh, 200 microns. And this is my cable layer, where uh, the reaction takes place. It's around 10, 20 microns. And this is my membrane. It's around like 100 microns, depends on the type of the membrane. But this picture is also important because when you have water transferred from one side to the other side, you have also the transfer going on in the GDL and in the uh, gas channels. So whatever the water transferred from anode to cathode does not stop that. So it continues, it continues uh, to the, into the GDL and then to the gas channels and go up. Or it can be from anode to cathode or from cathode to anode. Like this, uh, another important result that why we are looking at the spatial distribution instead of just taking whole fuel cell as a lump, lump uh, thing. Because the water transfer can be from anode to cathode at some parts, like at the upper parts, and it can be from, ca uh, from cathode to anode on the lower parts. So you don't have a net, okay, so you, you, you can have a net water transfer from anode to cathode, but that doesn't mean that you, you have a uh, water transfer from anode to cathode all the way from down to the up. Okay? So you have distribution of the transfer actually. Like you can have transfer here on the upside, you can have transfer here from anode to cathode on the downside. Okay. And uh, now let's look at the conservation of momentum, uh, which is the flow. Now, the conservation of momentum is what governs uh, the movement of the plates. So when when you have uh, air coming in to the jet engine, okay. And there is a uh, explo uh, sorry, uh, combustion uh, of the fuel, and uh, you have like a faster jet coming out of the plane, okay, from the jet engine. So that faster, faster flow is actually pushing you, pushing the plane forward. That's what called thrust, and this. Uh, the result of conservation of momentum. The conservation of momentum is exactly the same in fuel cells. Like we have uh, interactions between fluid particles in the flow field. So if you have a pipe like that, right, the momentum of that species, sorry, that particle at that point is transferred to this particle so that this particle is also moved forward and this particle also transferred the momentum to this particle and it's also moving forward up to this boundary where you don't have any flow because the particle, the fluid particle at this boundary is stick it doesn't move so that boundary we call no slip boundary and uh, we have a, a flow profile like the velocity profile, like that in a typical pipe um, pipe flow. Uh, it's actually very similar to fuel cell uh, flow fields. In a, in, a, in a fuel cell flow field, we have similar flow flow field like that. Like these are very nasty equations, momentum equation. Uh, under some circumstances, these are also called navier stokes equations. Here. I'm not going to details on that, but I just want to say that this is the uh, inertia term, like the acceleration term, 
these are the friction term, okay? These are the friction term. This is the pressure term. This is the gravity term. When you look at it mechanistically, it's nothing but F equals MA. All right? It's nothing but, okay, I'll finish in 10 minutes, don't worry. How is it F equals MA? So this is rho, okay? Uh, this is written in a unit volume. So when you multiply the density with the volume, you have mass, okay? So this is actually your mass. And this is actually your inertia, okay? So you have mass times inertia is equal to total force, external force, exerted on your particle. In this case, fluid particle. And what are those? The gravity of your fluid particle, the pressure difference uh, applying on your fluid particle, and the friction, the friction force applying on your fluid particle. <coughs> All right. Yeah, this is <laughs> what I was talking about here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we have a special case in a fuel cell where uh, this figure, which we went through, shows better. <coughs> so you have flow fields, all right? Like this. Flow fields, 100% open. The flow is not obstructed or does not experience any obstacle or anything. Like it's 100% open, all right? The flow fields, the open channels. But the GDLs, the catalyst layers, they are not open. They are like a composite, composite bodies. They are uh, mixed with some solid, solid phase, and there are some pores in it. But these pores are continuous, so that a fluid particle comes here and goes, like in an in ordinary moment, to the uh, membrane side. So we have a special equation for porous media like this. I go back here. All right. This is another example. Like this is a ACL picture of a porous porous media, porous electrode. So in a porous electrode, uh, we can approximate that next equation in the simple, very simple equation. Okay. And uh, we can only apply uh, this what co what's called Darcy Darcy's law uh, in the electrodes and catalyst layers, whereas uh, we apply that momentum equation in the flow field. All right, and uh, the conservation of heat <coughs> is still very similar in terms of deriving, and we have. Uh, like the diffusion, we have different types of uh, heat transfer mechanism. What is the conduction, which is driven by the temperature difference uh, between one side to the other side. And there is also convection. It's very similar to the species transfer. And the conductive flux is represented like that, K being the conductivity of the material. And this is uh, the convective flux. And we, when we put it in our general equation, we ended up uh, in this equation with our source term. Okay? And this is our transient term. Uh, I want to go briefly about uh, the heat transfer modes in a fuel cell. So we have convective heat transfer uh, wherever we have flow. <laughs> which is like our flow fields, okay? And uh, it's not shown here, but in a stack, you have this cell, you have this cell, and in, in, in between two cells, there is a cooling channel where a coolant, specific coolant, uh, is passing through, okay? So uh, the coolant is also uh, taking away the heat generated in the fuel cell, 
so that it, it controls the temperature of the fuel cell. Uh, so it's another uh, convective flow. Also, we have conductive flows, uh, which is both in the in the flow field and in the uh, solid materials. But we have conductive heat transfer from one cell to the other side uh, by the continuity of the uh, solid matrix. Okay? And we have heat generations. Um, heat generation is mainly due to the uh, reaction. A heat source can actually be represented as a lot, uh, lot parameter. So you have your theoretical voltage, okay? When you don't have any loss, when everything is ideal, you end, you, you end up with well, 1.2 volts, okay? But in a typical fuel celebration, it's not the case. In reality, you have a high curve like this. So, the difference between uh, this point, your operating point, and your theoretical voltage is actually contributing to the heat. It's actually a heat source. So, the heat, can, the heat generated can be defined as uh, the, your operating current here, right? Your operating current here times back Vmax minus V operating, like your operating voltage. <coughs> but if you want to know where exactly uh, this heat source is distributed, I can tell you that there are heat generation due to reactions at the anode and cathode cathode series. There are some ohmic losses and there are some contact losses at the interfaces. I mean the uh, GDL uh, cathode series interface, like you have a contact loss, which in return uh, change the temperature profile. Like uh, you don't have a complete temperature profile, you have a jump in the temperature profile. Okay, this is due to the contact loss. I'm running a bit faster. All right. So uh, this is the heat source uh, that you need to apply at the catalyst phase, and this is the heat source due to the ohmic losses you need to apply in the membrane. Also, charge transfer is the talk. Uh, there are two charge transfers. One is uh, positive charge transfer, and the other is negative charge transfer. The electronic charge uh, is transferred from anode to cathode, right? So uh, you have generation at the anode cathode here, and then by GDL and bipolar plate, then completing the circuit you uh, go to the cathode side, so you have your electron charge transfer in these regions, that are colored regions. On the other hand, ionic charge, ionic charge transfer uh, is happening at the catalyst layers and the membrane. A hydrogen proton atom, sorry, proton, uh, proton is generated at the end of catalyst layer and is transferred in the membrane and is depleted at the cathode cathode state. So you need to solve for ion charge equation in these three regions. And for these source terms, uh, we go back to uh, Professor Lamy's lectures and uh, we take some precious uh, equations to define our uh, current with the potentials, with the over potentials. <laughs> I think I'm running out of time, so I will skip this because Professor Lamy covered it a lot, very nicely. And this will be uh, the source terms, as described here, uh, like the Q uh, ELC is uh, the rate of electrons generated, and Q ionic is the rate of protons generated, and these can be uh, defined by uh, these equations called Butler-Wolmer equation. And Butler-Wolmer equation uh, can be uh, represented in simpler ways. For faster kinetics at anode, 
like hydrogen reaction is fast, so we have a linear equation, which is called the Tafel, Tafel kinetics. And for cathode, uh, it has slower kinetics, but we can drop uh, one term here for simplicity, and we have a simpler version. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. And then after we uh, put all the physical phenomena into the equations, we need to solve them, right? So, uh, in order to do that, first we need to uh, discretize our domains. And this is a good example of a Formula 1 race car. This uh, put in a, a CFD solver. And, you know, the discretization of the domain uh, is not evenly distributed. Like here, the mesh, this is what we call the mesh, okay? The mesh, at some parts, are very fine. Okay? And these are uh, the places where we expect significant changes in the physics. Like here, when the airflow, when the airflow hits the nose of the Formula, Formula 1 race car, there is a significant change in the physics, right? So in order to capture that variation, you need to have very fine mesh. Okay? But if you look at here, you have a very coarse mesh, which will do because but the flow field will be only related to some uh, certain extent of the Formula 1 race car. Like you won't have too much effect here when you go uh, very far away from the car, right? So you don't have too much, too much changes in your original flow field. So uh, this coarse mesh will be fine. And then uh, you have different solution methods. And uh, this is really a different lecture, so I'll finish it here. But just to tell, the final order methods uh, is the most favorite uh, solution methods that is used in fuel cell modeling and finite difference method is also used and very old technique and there is also finite element method like the finite element method is more used in uh, you know, the mechanic structural simulations but you can apply it in uh, CFTs as well and you have some other methods like spectral methods where you impose uh, Fourier, Fourier series expansions on your solutions. That's it. Any questions? Um, like this, up to you actually, <laughs> because <laughs> there are many so there are many softwares in the market, and uh, each one has advantage uh, for its own. Like there, there is Fluent, there is Star CD, there is Console. Fame Lab? Fame Lab is not Console. Can you, use, uh, can you use Cruiser for that also? Uh, that one, I, I, I didn't hear or about it. Or with this, uh, I, uh, for me, all of them are tools. Okay. Like you can choose whatever you want, like whatever you feel comfortable with. That's fine. But some people are not like that. Some people think that uh, finite element is not acceptable. <laughs> because finite element methods uh, was not uh, preferred like 20 years ago in CFT. Because it started with uh, you know, structural mechanics solutions. Finite volume was a predominantly used one. So. I think up to 1980s or I don't know the exact dates, but uh, International Journal of Fluid Dynamics did not accept any study who used finite elements <laughs> as, as a solution method in CFT. So, but the trend nowadays, what's the trend? The trend? What's the trend? What's the most common solver here? Well, uh, the trend is console is, uh, console is very getting very popular but if you ask me I use console I also use star CD fluent and the other software and if you want to do simple simulations like 2D simulations console is the best 
for sure. But if you want to do 3D simulations, like a whole uh, serpentine channel simulation, whole stack simulation, console uh, will be too clumsy, too sluggish. Like you, because uh, finite volume is developed for especially solving Navier Stokes equation. And there are some schemes uh, that really deal with Navier Stokes equation. Navier Stokes equation is a very nice equation, as I said. It has many non linear terms. And how to do, deal with it, finite volume methods was developed. And there are uh, some specific tools, some sp specific skills uh, that, that deals with those nonlinearities. In finite element, uh, it is a problem now, I guess.